Hello and welcome to At Home With, a podcast from the residential business at Knight Frank. At Home With offers a glimpse inside the lives of some of the world's foremost property experts. And every week you'll be hearing conversations with agents from across our business about how they made it to where they are today, how they found their dream homes and how we can help you find yours. I'm your host, journalist and social media executive at Knight Frank, Rebecca Hills. Today I'm joined by Maria Morris, our head of residential for the Middle East. Maria and I will be chatting about the highs and lows of her career, her most exciting property sales, and what it really takes to make it in the world of real estate. Maria joined Knight Frank back in 2014 and now leads our residential division for the Middle East, specialising in prime and super prime sales. With nearly 20 years experience in the property industry and a large social media following to her name, Maria is leading the way in the digital transformation of the property industry. Maria, it's a pleasure to welcome you onto the podcast. Thank you so much, Becky. I'm incredibly excited um, to be recording this with you today and hopefully the audience will find it insightful. How are you doing today? How have things been in lockdown and life generally in the Middle East at the moment? Life is good at the moment Um, and I'm so pleased that I can say that now. I think Being here in Dubai, we reacted fairly quickly and fairly promptly to the COVID situation. So the early part of lockdown for us um, was challenging. Um, You know, we were pretty much at home 24-7. So, you know, it took a little while to mentally adjust to that process. But fortunately, now we're easing restrictions here. We're coming out of it. We can enjoy um, you know, the sunshine and, and the lifestyle elements here a little bit more. And I think that's really, really helped um, in recent weeks. So I can't complain. I'm very fortunate to be, you know, stuck here in this wonderful city. So yeah, life is good at the moment. And from a market perspective, how has the Middle East coped with COVID? Well, here in Dubai, uh, we're very fortunate in let's say normal times um, outside of the COVID situation that our market here is incredibly diverse. So we sell to, you know, over 150 different nationalities um, in terms of the real estate market here in Dubai. So that in itself has had its challenges um, during COVID because as soon as we shut down our borders, obviously the movement of people um, coming into the country was restricted. That said, um, again, in recent weeks where we've been able to ease restrictions slightly, we're now conducting viewings and we're now seeing um, you know, significant levels of activity. So whilst it might not be at the volumes that it was pre-COVID, um, I think it's encouraging at the current time to see that, you know, there there is still life out there in the real estate market in Dubai and there and, and we're still transacting. As I mentioned in my intro, you've been in the property industry for nearly 20 years. So I'd love to find out a little bit more about what it was that motivated this decision and why you chose this career path. I think this is the moment where everyone would probably normally say that they were destined to enter the property industry or they always had, you know, it was always something they wanted to do. Um, Truth be told, that 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 probably isn't, you know, it couldn't be further from the truth (laughs) with uh, with my career in the early days. Um, I studied economics and psychology at university um, and I always wanted to go into marketing. I wanted to be a marketer. Um, And it just so happened that uh, an opportunity came up with a residential developer in the UK. And it was it was a marketing coordinator position. I mean, it was, you know, very low paid graduate position straight out of university. But very, very quickly, I fell in love with the property industry. And I realized that it was a sector that I could do what I love in terms of marketing um, and also, you know, get to represent some amazing properties. And yeah, very quickly, what went from me thinking that I only wanted to do marketing or I wanted to work in advertising and, um, you know, change, change very quickly. And it, and it started the framework of, of my career. And almost 20 years later, you know, here I am very much in real estate. So, um, yeah, a bit of a strange start. Wasn't necessarily planned to go into property, but now I, I can't imagine doing anything else. I absolutely love love my job. Mm, and I suppose marketing, I mean, speaking as a marketer, I suppose marketing does play a huge role in property and you can't have one without the other. So do you think that those initial marketing skills have really helped you get to the position that you are now? For sure. And I think it, it's certainly been uh, a transition in our industry over recent years. But But going back to the early stages of my career, if you were selling property, it was very much sales based. Um, you know, certain individuals in the industry at the time didn't see the importance of marketing. And as you quite rightly say, you know, one goes hand in glove with the other. 
but it was very, very sales driven. Um, and, you know, our, our, our industry has transformed, as I say, in recent years, you know, from a digital perspective, from the, the way that we market our, ourselves and our properties. But back then it was, it was very traditional. Um, marketing was seen as placing an advert in a newspaper. So to have some small part in, you know, being able to change uh, the company that I was at, at the time in terms of their ideals and, and what we could achieve, um, you know, was, was hugely important. So, yeah, I think that's been a little bit of a niche that I've tried to carve in my career so I can balance between sales and marketing and, and sort of have one cohesive approach, I suppose. And how did you find that transition moving from the marketing side to the sales side? Did you face any backlash? People saying that you couldn't go from one to the other? Was there any stigma attached to the fact that you'd worked in marketing in the past? Or did you find it quite an easy and smooth move from one to the other? A hundred percent. Again, I, you know, I think when I look back, times were very different back then. Um, and I was also very young coming into an industry, you know, with very little experience. So, you know, all the great ideas I had were faced by, uh, you know, sometimes retaliation from people that had been in the industry 20, 30 years, um, who weren't necessarily as forward thinking in where we wanted to take our business. So it was a challenge. I think, I think especially back then you, you were seen as in one camp or the other. Um, but, you know, I quickly, realized that you could pivot between the two. And as I say, actually, they, they both go hand in glove. So um, if it, it was the people that quickly picked that up at the time that actually accelerated in their career the quickest. Um, and I'd like to think, you know, even from a young age, I started taking quite senior roles on within that business. Um, and I'm, I'm certain that having that hybrid outlook um, was, was testament to, to me achieving those positions. And you mentioned there that you were taking on senior roles at a young age and you were one of the younger people in the business and there were a lot of older people who had different ideas about how things should be done. And when you guys start out in your career, you're not necessarily blessed with the same confidence that you have, say, 20 years in. Do you think that you've always been quite a confident and proactive, uh, an outspoken person that could just put themselves forward for those roles? Or was it something that you had to fake it till you make it and sort of get to the point where you, you thought that you could do it? I think it's safe to say anyone that's known me across my career would say I wasn't lacking in confidence. Um, I've obviously changed and, and reshaped, uh, you know, how what you would sort of determine as confident now. Um, but at the, at the time, you know, I went into into that first role thinking I could take on, you know, take over the world. Never mind, take on the world. Um, and you know, I think what was what was really helpful for me is that I had a very inspirational female leader um, that I worked for at the time, which again in itself was incredibly rare back then in in, in the real estate industry. I, I was on the development side of the fence. So working for a developer, you know, very much construction led, um, it was rare to, to have senior females in, in those kind of positions. But she was very inspirational in that she didn't dampen my enthusiasm. If anything, she encouraged it. And I think that just continued to give give me the confidence that, you know, as long as you worked hard and, and, you know, you learned and listened from the best that you could achieve anything regardless of age or even gender. So yeah, I was very fortunate and blessed that I got to work for such an amazing person early on into my career. And, and she really helped frame me and what I wanted to achieve going forward. And on this podcast, we talk a lot about mentoring and mentorship and how we can help each other in the industry and how other people have formed people's confidence and inspired them within their careers. What are your thoughts on the value of mentoring? I suppose you've alluded to it a bit there, but would you be able to expand a little bit more on what value having a mentor can have in your career? You know, it's not for everyone. Um, however, I think it should be because having a mentor and it doesn't when we talk about a mentor i think it's important to know that it doesn't actually have to be in the industry that you're working in um you know sometimes some of my best mentors have been in other industries but you know pioneers in their own business um and you know just being able to take guidance from them has has really helped me along the way and i think we should all as senior people in the industry now also give back our time because without, you know, the people that helped me along the way, I wouldn't be where I am now. So I'm very much one for also giving back to, to the younger people coming into the industry. And I think as well, it's great to be able to learn from them 
them too. You know, times change so incredibly quickly and we're now so much in a digital age that it's, it's not just a one way, one way thing. I think you can also learn from the people that you're mentoring. So, um, yeah, I think it's hugely important and, you know, I'm very much, I, I, you know, I know obviously everyone, um, I work closely with and, and, and yourself know that, you know, I'm a big believer in personal development and I think mentorship is, is a huge part of that. And you said there that you now mentor other people. How did you go about finding your mentees? And was there a particular moment or incident that really inspired you to start making that decision to mentor people? Yeah, I I, I would say it was probably around, you know, not, not that long ago, probably around 12 months ago. Um, and I started um, a new journey with with uh, a new coach, actually. And that's kind of what, what spurred it on. And I thought, you know, if I want to really... Um, take myself to the next level in terms of my own personal development, you know, how, how can I do that? And, and what, what would be important to me in terms of my evolution? And um, interestingly enough, and I'm sure we'll come on to it shortly, but I found that I was actually getting a lot of interaction via social media from younger people in the industry. And um, I took that as an opportunity to, to look at how you know, I could interact more with those type of people that were that were taking their time to reach out to me and ask for my advice. So that's kind of how it started. Um, it was just a bit of a shift in in my mindset, um, and yeah, it's just just taking it on from there. And we'll definitely touch on social media later on in our conversation. But for now, I really want to dig into that self development part, as I find that that's a particularly interesting thing to talk about. And as somebody who's really interested in that field too, I'd love to find out how you've gone about incorporating that into your career. And so often with things like self development, people can give you funny looks and make comments about doing it. And some people perceive it as a bit strange, and especially within the property industry, which can sometimes be seen as a little bit more old fashioned and stuck in its ways. How have you gone about incorporating those lessons of self development? into your work and did you ever face any backlash or funny looks about doing it I think it's probably more slightly accepted now um but again you know even going back five years never mind 10 years um you're quite right people could look at you almost like if you had two heads if you were talking about personal development and um uh, and leveling up and you know and using different terminology to what people were, were used to however I think it's so much more than just being a, a skill set. You, you, anyone can learn a set of skills um, to do any role, whether that's in property or any other industry. But if you really want to keep pushing yourself, um, why wouldn't you be invested in your own personal development? I mean, I find it quite bizarre that people wouldn't want to um, because it's continually um, pushing yourself um, and those around you and your team, especially as a leader, I think, you know, you have to lead by example. And if you're not continually pushing your own capabilities, then why would the people that work for you do the same? So there's a, there's a saying that my, uh, my brother actually introduced me to very early on in my career, which is there's no growth in comfort, comfort. And, you know, it's so, so true that, you know, everyone can sit in their comfort zone. They can reach a certain level within their career and they could sit there for the rest of the days. But, you know, if you're the type of driven and ambitious person that continually wants to push themselves and achieve more in their career, then for sure, you've got to invest in your own personal development. And ultimately, self-development is all about pushing those boundaries and getting yourself out of your comfort zone and trying different things. And on that topic, you moved to Dubai in 2014 to join Knight Frank and, and run our Middle East office, getting out of your comfort zone and adapting to being in a completely new city and in a completely new role. And what inspired you to make that move? Oh, I think that comfort zone analogy is, you know, is is perfectly apt for, for my move to Dubai. Um, I loved working in the UK and um, for, at the time, I was working for a, a very well-respected, um, a successful property developer in the UK. And I loved my my role there. However, the opportunity came up for for moving to Dubai and, and working for Knight Frank here. And yeah, completely outside my comfort zone, but I knew it could be a great opportunity to really broaden my skills um, and take what I'd achieved in the UK from a residential development perspective to the next level. So, you know, I'm never one to, to shy away from a challenge. And it was exciting. Um, I love Dubai. I, I was very used to Dubai anyways. I, I holidayed here regularly. I, I used to come here for, for work 
um, with my previous company. So, so I knew the city reasonably well. It wasn't a completely cold move. Um, but, but yeah, it was one that I thought, uh, you know, I needed to take on. I took on that challenge to, to, to reach the next stage of my career. So to somebody who's seen your career trajectory and thinks, I would love to move to Dubai, I would love to work in the environments and in the markets that you do, what advice would you give to them on getting into the profession and being successful? I think it's all about learning about different markets around the world, you know, getting an interest in what's happening globally in global markets, or, you know, perhaps that's just one or two specific markets that, that those individuals might be interested in. But I think if, if you're looking to take the step into international property, then it's, it's really about getting a, a, a global lens on, on the market and what's happening and just keeping abreast of, of different um, sort of topics in, in, in different markets that affect different markets. You know, that said, I, when I came to Dubai, whilst I had obviously researched the real estate market here and, um, you know, thought I was coming sort of fairly well equipped until you sort of get the boots on the ground and, and really get stuck in and, and sort of learn in real time. You know, there's, there's, there's so much preparation you can do, but at the same time, I think it's great to sort of gain experience. So, you know, I think if opportunities arise, then regardless of where you're based, like, like myself, you know, I was based in London at the time, but if the opportunity arises, I think it's just being open to that. And if it's something that interests you, then, you know, pursue it. And to bring things back onto your role now, what are the big differences that you've noticed between the Middle Eastern and the UK European property markets? How are those two markets really different? Because Dubai is still relatively young in, in, in its age. I mean, we're, you know, 40, 50 years old in terms of, uh, you know, the, the UAE being formed. Um, we have to be a little bit more agile, should I say here, um, which is, is great. I love it because it keeps every day very very exciting and interesting. Whereas in the UK, I think, you know, everything was a little bit more formulaic in its approach um, because nine times out of 10, you know, whether whether it was dealing with a property transaction or, um, you know, consultancy on a new development, you knew the process, um, you know, from the planning process through to bringing something to market through to, you know, closing a transaction from a legal perspective, you know, the, the processes and procedures were quite firmly set. So, so it was a little bit easier to uh, chart the path, I suppose. In Dubai, because everything is, is young and evolving, um, you know, it's a little different in that respect. But as I say, that for me actually is, is one of the, the elements that I enjoy the most because it means that we, as Knight Frank Middle East here, can have real impact on, on the market and actually help um, shape and frame it uh, from our input as well. So I think it's hugely exciting and hugely uh, challenging. And something that I'm picking up as a thread that's running through all of your answers is that theme of adaptability. And as you said, agility, do you think that that capacity to be able to mold yourself and adapt and be agile within the property industry is what sets you apart from other people and ultimately leads to a successful career in this industry? Oh, 100%. 100%. If, if you're not able to pivot and and as I say be agile um you know you you need to be able to every property is different every client requirements are different um whether that's individual clients or institutional clients whether that's consultancy or just traditional um you know single family home sales um if if you can't adapt to each of those situations and be agile then you know, probably property isn't for you because um, there's no sort of one way, shape or form to, to do things. And um, I think all the individuals, certainly that we work with, um, but across the industry equally, you you know, they, they have that different varying levels, but they have that level of agility in their DNA. Um, and I think it, it's, it takes the current situation, um, the ability to navigate and pivot is paramount to to being successful in real estate because we will always face there will always be a challenge whether it was the global financial crisis whether it's you know the current situation with covid um you know we have to be resilient and we have to be agile and they are two of the best skill sets or traits i should say um that i think everyone needs in their locker to to be successful not 
perhaps just in real estate, in, in any industry, um, you know, resilience and agility are, are paramount, as I say. And that agility, that capacity to be agile and adaptable must feed really well into working with so many different offices around the world. And as Knight Frank, we're active in over 60 territories. How do you best utilise that global network in your role now? I mean, I, anyone, you know, again, that knows me very well, um, I'm so passionate about our global network. Um, I, and, and, and to be fair, that was probably one of the main drivers um, behind joining Knight Frank. I sort of made the decision to move to Dubai, of course, but actually I really wanted to join a company with that global footprint. Um, and I've been blown away in the last six years as, as to how collaborative it is. Um, you know, I often say to my clients here, my institutional clients here, that Knight Frank, whilst we've got a huge footprint across the world, it really is like family. And and I love collaborating with with different colleagues in different territories and I think going back to that earlier question that you asked Becky with regards to people that want to take a step into international markets for me I mean how lucky am I I've got all the insight and all the intelligence and all the research that we produce across a country level all over the world at my fingertips so I can always stay informed and um, you know, insightful for for our clients here to have our finger on the pulse of what's what's happening globally. So yeah, I mean, there's no bigger advocate. I think you know, I wax lyrical all the time about uh, you know the importance of you know working uh, within a global network at Night Frank, and and I love it to the point about staying informed and and being up to date with research. This has come up a lot in the conversations that I've been having, and we talk a lot about how sales is often perceived as this industry where it's all about the gift of the gab and it's all about just kind of talking. And the one thing that I've noticed about everyone that I've spoken to on here is that. Knight Frank specifically, we have this research department and we are incredibly passionate about having that verified and up to date and intelligent, those intelligent relationships with our clients. How do you use our research team to help your clients? And do you think that it's impossible to form really long lasting and successful relationships with clients without that market leading information? I think, again, just talking from a personal perspective, I came from the developer world. So my view and outlook on life normally has quite a pragmatic, fact-based um, narrative around it. Um, a lot of what we do here, which I, I think, you know, people are not always aware of the consultancy piece that we do especially for our projects before they come to market or even the consultancy work we'll do if we're looking to bring a new listing to market. Um, and that is very fact-based. Um, I like to work hand in glove with our research team um, to ensure, as I say, you know, we've, we, we've got our finger on the pulse um, when we're advising our clients. And I think our clients actually really appreciate that. Whilst we, you know, always look for an optimistic view on our markets and, and what will what will happen with our markets going forward and look for trends and insight. I think we're also realists and we report, you know, what what's happening, especially, you know, whether it's Dubai market or global markets, you know, we report in real time and having the research team to support us with that is, is phenomenal. Um, you know, and I think that's a real key strength and string to our bow. But, but really to answer your question, I think the main positive from that, as I say, is that our clients respect our honesty um, and that we're reporting the facts. Uh, and, and that is really what forges long lasting relationships because you, you build a very trusting relationship with those clients to, to inform them um, in, in their decision making rather than selling to them. Um, and when I say selling, I mean in the sense that you spoke about it where some people feel it's just talking people into submission. Um, but, but yeah, I think we're advisors as much as we are agents. So yeah, certainly my clients very much appreciate that research-led approach. Something that we have at Night Frank that has really grown in its importance over the past few years is our social media champion program. And while not a strict program in the traditional sense, it's something that a lot of people have started adopting and getting on board with. Throughout our conversation, you've spoken about adaptability and being authentic 
and having those skills in order to see what's going and coming in the market and be able to move yourself and pivot around it in order to be successful. Why did you decide to get on board with social media and what's your experience been like of using it within the property industry? I was probably a little bit late to the party with with social media. Um, And then I saw the impact and quickly realized, you know, the digital transformation that was taking place with, you know, before our very, very own eyes. So it's, it's probably only been in the last few years that I've really invested a lot of time in, in, into my social media accounts. Um, But for me, you know, not to keep using the same, the same wording, but authenticity with social media, as you say, is hugely important because um, when I started you know, sort of, even if it's just posting on Instagram, I was looking at what other people were doing. I was posting what I thought my audience would be interested in. And then I quickly found out that actually just by being you um, is what makes your content engaging and interesting. And if you're constantly trying to be a different version of yourself on social media, you'll very quickly become found out and ultimately you won't have any engagement with followers so you know for me it's it's just about being authentic it's being true to yourself um and you know if you look at uh, my instagram as an example against maybe one of my colleagues instagrams we're both amazing at what we do we're both you know experts in our fields but you know i'm a female in business in the middle east that happens to run a fantastic residential team that sells both individual villas and developments versus maybe um, a colleague that might focus purely on south of France or London or you know a different market so so I think you have to sort of carve your own path with social media so so to speak and yeah being authentic is is what will get you the most engagement Um, and if you're just doing it because you feel you have to do it, then, you know, it's a waste of time, um, because you'll, you know, there's, you've got to be fully committed. And I think those who are not fully committed to engaging with social media going forward are going to be left behind. And the great positive thing about where we are at, at the current time is that I think people are realizing what a great connector it is. Um, and I'm seeing more and more sort of accounts pop up and and people really getting into their social media. And, and I love it. I love to see it. So um, yeah, I mean, you know, I'm a yeah, big, big fan of um, investing time in, into social media, but I think it's a really important connector. And, and I think it's, you know, going to be as important as face-to-face communication, emails, telephone calls going forward. I mean, it's it's rapidly transforming before our eyes and, and I think you have to adopt it and you have to, um, you know, as I say, be authentic and, and just be you. And while social media is great from a creative perspective and it allows you to have that creative outlet in what can sometimes be quite a stats-based and sales-focused industry, how do you go about using your Instagram as a commercial platform? What do you do to make it commercially successful? Yeah, that's a, that's a good question. I think social media shouldn't be viewed as, as a single entity. It has to be part of your overall um, sort of a cohesive you know, part of your commercial strategy. And sometimes my clients that I have the most amazing in-person relationships with will completely shock me. And I'll post something about a new listing or an amazing new villa that we've just taken on. And this is actually a real-time example because this happened last week. Um, And yeah, one of my, uh, you know, quite a long-standing client then started DMing me on Instagram about this this villa that we've posted. So, you know, I think it's, you can't look at it, as I say, in isolation. I think it has to be part of your overall engagement with with uh, your clients. Again, whether that in, be institutional clients or individuals. So um, for me, it's just an extension of what I do. Um, it's a reflection of my personality. It's a reflection of how anything that I put on social media would be the same conversation that I would have with someone face to face. Definitely. It's all about that interconnected and joined up and cohesive approach to it. You can't see everything as a single entity. It all has to be linked together. 
And have you got any stories of success that's been garnered as a result of social media? Are there any incidents that stick out in your mind in terms of things going really well as a result of a post? One of my most interesting um, engagements on social media is actually um, a client that now actually I consider, you know, not only a client, but a dear friend. And, And we actually started engaging via social media um and I, I i was sort of following some of some of his posts and realized that he had an amazing um uh sort of love for all things culinary and, and, and food and um and we were actually hosting an event in london um a, a few weeks later and i just you know we'd been engaging a little bit on social media for a while so i said you know would you like to come to this this private dinner that we're hosting at a, a michelin star chef restaurant and he did you know he accepted and that was purely all over social media you know we'd never met never spoken um and he attended the dinner um anyways fast forward because you know that was um well over a year ago we could be here a little while I'm conscious of time Becky um but the the moral of the story being is that actually now um, you know, we're, we're very close. We've attended, um, multiple events actually. So he, he's intended, attended more of my events. I've attended some of his events that he runs as a business. Um, and you know, we, we have a great trusting relationship now and potentially we're now helping him out with, uh, a requirement that he has at the current time. So, you know, I think for me, it's those kind of relationships that come out of social media that are probably more important than a direct inquiry on a property I might have just posted. It's it's about using it um, for long term relationships as as you would, you know, networking at an event with someone in person. So it's little wins like that. I I love those kind of success stories with my with my social because um, you know it takes something that's very digitally focused and it puts a real human element to it and. Yeah, for me, those are the those are the most exciting kind of case studies, as you would say, from from my social media journey. And to bring things back onto the property, this podcast is called At Home With. So I'd love to find out a little bit more about what it was that made you choose the home you're currently living in. Yeah, so I currently rent in in Dubai um, and I must admit that my when when we when we first moved here I wanted to be within a community that I I was a little bit more aware of than than other parts of Dubai but also that had a large expat um sort of community within it um and also my commute I'd gone from commuting in the UK for anything between 60 to 90 minutes each way a day Uh, my commute now I mean I'm sorry to say Becky because I know you're based in the UK but it's about 10 minutes so um the that that little shift in lifestyle for me it didn't matter how how late I stayed in the office I knew I was always going to be back home in 10 minutes um so that so that was very important in terms of location so I'm in Dubai Marina um which you know, is, is, is beautiful in itself, but it's also very close to the beach, to the Palm Jumeirah. Um, and as I say, just 10 minutes from the office, which is, is fantastic. But I think for me, um, because a large part of what I do, um, normally outside of where we are at the moment, um, is traveling around our network. So I wanted to ensure that I had something that was secure, that was modern, um, that had great amenities. You know, we've got fantastic security here and, and sort of concierge. Um, so for me, it works really, really well with my lifestyle in Dubai. Um, and then I suppose the other main element of my home life here is is my little puppy dog, Eric. Um, so uh, yeah, he's we've uh, he's almost got his own room. Um, he's, he's very, very fortunate, um, in, in the, in the space that we have here. So, um, Dubai living for me is, is very easy. Um, and, com- you know, it's all about convenience and great space. Um, and yeah, so I, so I love my, love my apartment here and it's, um, um, it sort of ticks the boxes as well. I love contemporary architecture. So, um, because everything's still quite new and shiny in Dubai, uh, you know, everything's very contemporary. So definitely ticks the boxes from a design perspective as well for me. I'm very jealous of that commute. <laughs> <laughs> I know. I mean, I, I mean, I, I sometimes I started, um, there was a phase where it could take even less than 10 minutes and I would see, I would put a song on my, um, on my Spotify and see, 
like whether I could get to the office by the time the song finished. So, you know, there, there's times where there's no traffic that you can actually get there in about five minutes. So, um, yeah, sorry about that, Becky. That's that's rubbing rubbing salt in the wound. <laughs> that's painful to hear, especially when I'm when I'm getting the northern line every day. Um, but to bring it back to the property and away from the tube, um, I'd love to hear if there's any particular client experience or property sale memory that you have that really sticks in your mind and that you'd like to tell us a little bit more about. Look, I think actually, I my my default answer would would normally be. Um, you know, for example, we've got an amazing project here called the Royal Atlantis. And, um, you know, there, there's there been several clients there that sort of come in looking for one thing and actually leave buying another. And and those kind of, um, you know, relationships with clients and, and, and sales, you know, you, I always love those kind of sales where you actually listen to what that client wants and actually um, they end up buying something uh, that, you, you, you know, you've advised when they've come in and really specifically thought they wanted something else. So, so they're always pleasing. But actually, I think some of my fondest transactions um, have been back in the earlier days in my career when at the time I was dealing a lot with sort of first-time buyers. And to play a part in someone finding their first home is, is incredibly special because – you know, that's, it's their first step on that journey and it's their first home. And whether that's, you know, a, an individual or a young couple or someone looking to start a family or whatever that may be, um, it's such an important milestone in their own life journey that if, as I say, if you've been able to play a little part in in creating that, I think that's actually sort of, for me, as I say, that's some of my fondest memories were, were helping people get on the property ladder. But don't get me wrong. I mean, I love, I love what we do now because we get to deal with the most phenomenal, um, you know, best in class properties around the world. So, uh, but yeah, some of those fondest, most sort of heartwarming moments were probably uh, back back in the day, early days of my career, sort of working more with first time buyers. And you mentioned there the Royal Atlantis, which is an incredibly exciting development that we're working on at the moment. Would you be able to give us a little bit more information on this and explain why it's so exciting? I think one of the most enjoyable aspects of of my role currently is as we've touched on I know a lot during the conversation but it's it's that global aspect um, and being able to represent some of the very best um, you know properties around the world and you know coming from the developer background whilst I love you know everything that we represent I do have a little affinity for for residential development you know it's it's in my it's in my bones and um, and being able to, you know, frame and shape via our, you know, project marketing consultancy, whether that's in Sydney. I mean, we've got the most amazing scheme in Sydney um, that that we exclusively represent. Um, you know, I've I also spend a lot of time in the US with our colleagues there, and <clears throat> some of the projects in New York and LA and Miami, it, you know, are just phenomenal. Um, and then obviously here on on our doorstep, I've had the pleasure of of working on the Royal Atlantis residences for the last sort of five and a half years, um, and framing that consultancy piece before bringing it to market is is something that I'm you know incredibly proud of um and that you know will I'm sure be you know uh, from from my own personal standpoint will be a huge part in 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 my career in terms of my legacy and what what I contributed to um a, across the years so you know it's it, it's absolutely phenomenal. I mean, it's it's very hard to convey it over this podcast. Um, you know, seeing is really believing because the sheer scale of the project is phenomenal. Um, you know, and we, and we have 231 residences there and um, they all benefit from outside space. So at the moment where, you know, we're given the, the, the current situation, we're getting a lot of interest from potential buyers because of that indoor outdoor living um, and that flexible living space. Um, but, but yeah, it's been an absolute labor of love and a privilege to be involved with it from conception and then through to when it completes um, uh, next year. So, you know, I have joked with the developer that, you know, you have those plaques in in London. I, I sort of suggested that perhaps because of all the blood, sweat and tears that we put into the consultancy work to, to make it best in class for Dubai, that I could have a plaque on the Royal Atlantis. Um, they haven't quite agreed yet, but um, but yeah, we'll see. But it's an amazing project. And if you haven't 
seen it i you know i do recommend anyone listening to check it out because it's it's a one of a kind that will not be replicated again in dubai or equally potentially anywhere else in the world And so to begin to wrap up every podcast, we do a quick fire round. And the first question of which is London or country? I'm a little bit torn on this. I'm a city. I'm a city girl normally, but I did grow up in the country, in the Norfolk countryside, um, for those of you that are listening in the UK, uh, which is quite rural. Um, Do you know, I think I'm going to say country. I think as I've got a little older, we won't, we don't need to say how old, but as I've got a little older, I think the appreciation for the countryside and outside space um, is much more than it was certainly when I was growing up. I couldn't wait to run away to the city lights, you know, and move to London. But, but now I think, you know, with age, you get a newfound appreciation for, for, you know, countryside and outside space. Classic or contemporary? Oh, contemporary. Every day of the week, contemporary. Dubai or Abu Dhabi? Oh, that's uh, Becky. I, I, I live in the UAE. <laughs> I'm not sure. I'm not sure I can say either. I mean, look, I, I live in Dubai, so let's say Dubai. Call or email? Uh, call, um, but I think you know maybe we might need to change that to call, email, or Instagram direct message. Given our early conversations, office or working from home. Again, it's so interesting, isn't it? If you'd have asked me that six months ago, I would 100% have said office. I'm, I'm Mrs. Corporate. I love the office environment and I love being around my colleagues. But I think over the last three months, um, I've really enjoyed the adjustment to working from home. Tea or coffee? Uh, coffee. It, again, for anyone that knows me, I drink a lot of coffee a day. I really need to cut back, but I love my coffee. Swimming pool or tennis court? Uh, pool. Um, probably again because I live in Dubai, but definitely swimming pool. Walk or run? Neither. Dare I say, I'm not a big um, cardio person, so it's definitely not run. But I do love training. I love going to the gym. But for for the purpose that this is supposed to be a quick fire round, and I'm taking a very long time to answer every question, let's say walk. <laughs> <laughs> Amazing. And the last question, the most difficult one potentially, is the UAE or the UK? Oh, that is so tough. Um, Look, I love, I love the UK. Um, my family still live in the UK. Obviously, I've got lots of friends, amazing colleagues. Um, and I'm fortunate that I get to come back to our amazing global HQ in, in London fairly regularly. Um, but I'm going to say the UAE. Um, I've you know, been fortunate to call it home now for, for, as I say, almost six years. So I have to go with UAE. And so to wrap up the podcast, the one question we ask everybody who comes on is, what does connecting people and property perfectly mean to you? It's, it's tough because I think on face value, um, clearly, you know, the the initial interpretation for me is that obviously it's it's about what we can deliver at Night Frank in terms of connecting our clients with with their dream homes or their perfect investment, whatever the you know, depending on their requirements. But actually, I think I. I feel there's like a deeper, a deeper meaning in that. And for me, it goes back to that global connectivity um, message that we were talking about earlier and, and how, you know, we're so fortunate um, or I feel very fortunate to, to work with some of the best people, you know, the best experts in their fields across the world. So for me, it's actually about having, you know, connecting the best experts within our network with the best properties to be able to service then our uh, whether it's buyers or sellers in in the best way so two two meanings for me amazing Maria thank you so much thank you it's been an absolute pleasure um, and really enjoyed it Becky thanks so much for listening to this episode of at home with if you enjoyed this episode please make sure to subscribe on apple Podcasts, spotify acast or wherever you get your podcasts we'd also love it if you shared this episode on social media and please check out the show notes for more information i'll be back next wednesday with another exciting episode <laughs>